All right, thanks. And uh, just so that everyone knows, we're recording today. Yeah, so uh, let's just, I'm a combinatorist. Um, I think as I've moved on from graduate school, I finished my PhD 10 years ago, um, I've come to realize that that means different things to different people. Um, and so I'm going to give a, a flavor of the types of questions in combinatorics that I'm interested in and that my collaborators are interested in uh, today. Um, talk a little bit about some of my results, but also just what is an interval order. So let's start with what I mean by a POSAT. Uh, I've bolted the word finite here because um, it's not necessary, but I don't like to think about infinite sets or infinite things, okay? Um, everything I care about is finite, and so uh, there are some obnoxious technicalities one could get into if we were going to allow infinite sets here. So a finite set. So a post set it is a finite set with a binary relation that's reflexive, antisymmetric, and transitive. And just to make sure we're all on, on the same page, right? So reflexive means x less equal to x for all x. Transitive is our usual x less equal to y. And y less equal to z implies x less equal to z, right? These are the things that um, if you teach an intro to proofs class, you almost invariably teach your students about um, equivalence relations, and then this winds up, uh, you get into those, but you always talk about symmetric, and I really love things that are anti-symmetric, so this, remember, is that this is the one that you may not remember. x less equal to y and y less equal to x implies that x equals y. Okay, so that should feel familiar because that's how we define the equality of two sets, right? And so with that recollection of what it means for two sets to be equal to one another, the example you can put in your head if you want to think about a poset would be the collection of subsets of some finite set ordered by the is a subset of relation, right? That, that's our prototypical example. Now I should caution you, the subset lattice has things like union and intersection right, which a general poset doesn't have necessarily. Uh, the subset lattice is a special type of poset called a lattice that has these operations more generally called meet and join, but that act like union and intersection. And so we won't assume that we have those sorts of things. In fact, lattice theory kind of, at least from a combinatorial perspective, went away in the 50s because they seem to have proved everything interesting that there was to, to be proved um, there. And we moved on to more general partial orders. So what do I mean by an interval order? An interval order is a poset where you have an association of each point in the poset to a closed bounded interval of the real line so that x is less than y in p if and only if right, the right endpoint of x is less than the left endpoint of y. So if you have this sort of situation, that goes with x less than y, and two intervals that overlap, this goes with z incomparable to w. And that's the generally standard symbol. It won't show up again in the talk, but the symbol we use for incomparable to. So, so overlapping area. intervals, Hi there. incomparable, okay. one interval to the left of the other is corresponds to the less than. Uh, notice that I didn't describe this as being a set of intervals because you could have two points of the poset associated to the same interval, right? So that, that's allowed. So it, you could think of this as a function from x to the set of closed bounded intervals, and we don't care whether that function is number one. Um, sometimes we're just going to think about this as the intervals and forget about that there might be a poset that we started with. Uh, and other times we'll really think about the poset and ask, is this an interval order? There's another more restricted class of interval orders um, that I'm going to call semi-orders uh, for historical reasons. It's a bad name. Um, 
now we realize that unit interval order would be a better name because it's an interval order where you can find this collection of intervals in such a way that every interval has the same length and so we might as well make them all unit intervals. And the semi-order, the first study of this was in logic and they were really thinking in terms of functions and, and ultimately it wound up being the endpoints of the intervals. Um, but I've been trained to use the term semi-order and so that's what we're going to use. But when you hear semi-order, that's just all the interval lengths are the same. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. Or I, I guess maybe you're going to do an example now, but um, you've got a post set and you have a set of, so you're, you're taking, you're, you're starting from the post set and you're associating intervals to each of the bits of the post set. So that's the way the definition works. Certainly, if you have a collection of if you have a collection of intervals, which you could take to be a multiset and have repeated, you can get the partial order back from that. Right. So if I gave you the intervals, you could go: is one left of the other? Yes. Then it is less than the other. If they overlap, then they're incomparable to one another. And then you would uh, you would then I mean from from those intervals then if a is less than b and b is less than c then you you wouldn't you wouldn't connect a and c you would just do the the, the connections from a to b and b to c in the post set right right yeah so so here um on the left we have uh, that's a nice segue into into my example right on the left here we have our usual order diagram for the post set and if you've not seen these before, up. remember we have transitivity. So this tells us that A is less than Y, and this tells us that Y is less than C. So because of transitivity, we also have A less than C. We don't draw that line there because this picture would become chaos very rapidly if we tried to do that. Oh, sorry, I've never seen these pictures before. With this, you're saying um, the top of it is like the biggest, the yes, smallest, so the top but... things are big and the bottom things are small. Just sort of like if you were going to draw the subset lattice, you'd put okay. one to n at the top, you'd put the empty set at the bottom. Um, yeah, so they're unlike if you're taking graph theory or seeing um, graphs in discrete mathematics, there we just kind of draw things all over the, the page and we don't really have a geometry unless you're worried about planar graphs perhaps here there is sort of a sense of gravity the smaller things are down at the bottom the larger things are are up at the top yeah i like uh, steven's uh, question as well uh, that or or a remark about how do why are there some that aren't interval orders how do we know yeah, that we're, we're we're getting there that's okay, that's, good. that's a, a very important question yes so but let's so just take before we move on, am I wrong to imagine these as just like you take some random post set and I'm just going to smear out each point into some interval of a length and then like just smash all of them down onto like onto a, a real line? Like if I imagine smearing them all right to left and then just flattening them into interval, is that a reasonable way to think about these things? In some sense, except not every post set is there a way to smear them out. Okay. And I've given away what, what's, what's okay. coming momentarily. Sure. All right. Well, um, you need a definition for a reason. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, we draw these sort of layered, but imagine them all living on the real line, but you couldn't tell them apart if I drew them all on top of each other. So we kind of draw this kind of layered perspective, but here we see Y's interval ends before C's. So that gives us Y less than C. And here we have C less than D because C's interval ends before D starts, but B overlaps with Y and with C and with D. So B is incomparable to Y, C, and D. And over here in the picture, we can see there's no relations implied between B and D, C, or Y. Right, so, so we have, um, we could go through and check every single one of these, but let's not. So here's, the question is everything in interval order and here I've drawn the post that we call two plus two. These are bold. The font is a little bit hard to discern. Two being that we have two pairwise comparable elements here, two more here, and the plus being disjoint union. 
And so just take a minute and if you got a piece of paper or just in your mind, what would a collection of intervals that represents this four point POSAT look like? Someone is, is holding something up. I, I, I ah, it, 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 except except now z is greater than x, or yes, right. So so this starts to be a problem. You can start to draw things. You're like you've got x and you've got y. Now Z has to come in here and I'm not gonna put ends on it, but it's gotta overlap both of them. So this is gonna be Z and I don't know where it ends, but it's gotta to touch X and it's gotta to touch Y, but now where do I put W? Right, I, he's gotta to be to the right of Z, but then he's over here somewhere, but then he can't hit X. Sounds like so, we need a different type of uh, space. Than, uh, than, a, than a plane. Yes, so, so we, we can't represent that using intervals. Now this one we can, we can take A and put it up here and we can put B and we can put C and we can put D. But I've not drawn this with all intervals having the same length. Pretend that B, C, and D have the same length. Just give me, you know, that. Uh, could you draw this as a semilinear? Could we draw this with all intervals having the same length, or is this one a problem for semiorders? No, A can't to overlap. Right. Yeah, right. Like A, A is gonna. It's got. If if it sticks out to the left to hit B, then it misses D, and if it sticks out to the right to hit D, then it misses B. Right. And so this this is not a semiorder. Sorry, can you remind me of the formal definition for our semi-order here? This is just the fact that um, if you have both directions of the, whatchamacallit, both directions of the inequality, you have equality, right? No, that's, that's anti-symmetric. Sorry, the, yeah, the sorry. Se semi-order is all the intervals have the same length. That, okay. that you can draw a picture. There exists oh, this a- Oh, the unit interval order. Yeah, unit that's interval why order. Why that's a better name, okay. Yes, yes. And if I could reprogram my brain to say unit interval order, I would. We did a find and replace at a paper recently because we, one of my co-authors prefers unit interval and we're like, well, it is an easier name for people to remember. But two of the three of us are like, we can't change what we say when we talk. <laughs> um, okay, so combinatoris in my universe, one of the things we're interested in, and I think mathematicians in general are interested in the idea of characterization theories, right? We wanna characterize things. I just taught the characterization of finite abelian groups to my modern algebra students before the end of the semester, right? So this is, I couldn't find a picture on the internet anywhere of Peter Fishburne. So I, through interlibrary loan, pulled this paper from 50 years ago now um, called Intransitive Indifference with Unequal Indifference Intervals in the Journal of Mathematical Psychology, which you probably didn't even know was a thing. Uh, it is still in print. Um, I pulled this paper not so much for this screenshot. I pulled the paper thinking maybe there's an example of an application that he cared about in social sciences in this paper and that, no. So I couldn't come, I like to think of these as like, they're important if you think about like job scheduling in computer science, something has higher priority over another job, but they also have like a running time that they have to, that it's gonna take for that job to, to complete or something like that. Um, this paper, I don't recommend it to anyone because <laughs> Fish, Fishburne is, um, he's notorious for difficult notation. And uh, he wanted to insist on deal dealing with the infinite cases as well. So lots of the theorems have like, well, if it's countable and blah, 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 but when it's finite, then it's all much nicer. He also wrote a book in the early 80s on interval orders and interval graphs. It's 
out of print. I have a copy. It's generally impenetrable, um, unfortunately, because in a couple of instances, it's still the only place that a couple of results are readily accessible. But what did he prove? He proved a five-part TFAE theorem about interval orders. Um, so POSET is an interval order if and only if his definition was actually not the definition I gave. His definition is number two here. That, that was his definition. Um, but the critical thing right now is the only thing that you have to avoid to be an interval order is two plus two. If you have that one picture we saw earlier, you're not an interval order. If you don't have it, you are. Is That's there? an incredibly small list of forbidden substructures. Uh, I also should be really clear that when I talk about sub poset, I really mean exactly this diagram that there's no other relations amongst these points. Okay, that the other four possible relations are all incomparabilities. Uh, I use the term suborder if I'm flexible on what happens with the things not shown in the picture. Um, some people would take a different definition there, so I want to be clear on that. Okay, what are downsets and upsets? Well, they're pretty descriptive names. So the downset of x is all the stuff that's less than x. The upset of x is all the stuff that's greater than x. Um, so those, those seem like things that we can get our hands on and we're going to get our hands on them here momentarily. And those four and five are actually critical to the algorithmic question. At the point where we say, well, if all we need to check for is two plus two, if you think from a computer science perspective, you'd say, okay, we're probably on like an order end of the fourth algorithm worst case. So it's efficient to decide, but could you find the interval representation? Sometimes that's a hard problem. Um, oh, the other thing I'll say is some of you may have heard the terms order filter and order ideal to describe what I'm calling upsets and downsets. Um, I don't like those terms because I can never remember which one is upset and which one is downset. So please don't assume that where I wrote them actually connect to which one they, they are. But I know people who think more about algebra often use, in particular, the order ideal terminology um, because it, it comes up there. Upset and downset are so incredibly descriptive that that's what we're going to use. Um, there's also a characterization theorem uh, from Scott and Supis earlier, right? I said this predated interval orders really being understood. A semi-order, you just need to avoid two plus two so that you're in interval order, and then you need to avoid that one plus three that we have. That's it. So they're really easy to test for. And like I routinely in the past, um, you know, have, have taught undergraduates like algorithms and just like, is this a semi order? Look, oh, no, here's a one plus three. These are not generally not the hardest things in the world to spot. Okay, so here's an algorithm um, from Greeno's PhD thesis at Dartmouth in 76. Um, it, it never got published as a journal article, um, so I've actually seen my OER textbook um, cited in modern journal articles as an accessible reference for this theorem because it's the only place people can readily find it in print. Um, so it's a little weird seeing a textbook uh, an OER textbook appear in MathSignet, but I have seen it in reference lists there. Step one, find the downsets and order them from small to large, right? They're totally ordered by inclusion if this thing is an interval order. And oh, wait a minute, that's an if and only if. So if we write down the downsets and they're not totally ordered by inclusion, we're done by the, the theorem from Fishburne, right? Those five things are all equivalent. And you actually can dig in a little bit and find the two plus two. Okay, so what are the downsides? Well, X and A have the empty set. There's nothing less than them. Uh, y has just the set containing A. B has the set containing A and X. C has the set containing uh, A, X, and Y. 
and D has the set containing A, X, Y, and C. Let's see, there are six points there, and I've got, okay, five downsets. Two of them have the same downset. Uh, and these are written down in order from smallest to largest. Now we're going to find the upsets and order them from largest to smallest. So let's see, A has the largest upset, which is B, Y, C, and D. Right? If we go up from A, we get B and Y and C and D. Uh, X's has B, C, and D. Uh, oh yeah, uh, let's see, so then yeah, Y has, Y has C and D. And just D is the upset for C. And then there's two of them that have the empty set being B and D. Now, imagine numbering these one, two, three, four. You don't have to imagine, I just did it. Um, okay, so then A's interval. Its left endpoint comes from the downsets, and its right endpoint comes from the upsets. So its A's interval is one, one. So I'm allowing length zero intervals that just contain a single point. That's, that's an interval. Um, we could do this with a, a little bit of a modification in a way that would avoid that. Um, actually, Greeno's version doesn't create length zero intervals. In fact, I think he created open intervals. Uh, B, let's see, it has the third uh, downset and the fifth upset. So the interval for B is the interval from three to five. And that is UPS, but we'll just ignore them. Um, C has the interval from four to four. D is five, five, x, left end point down here at one, right end point at two, and y is two, one, two, three. I, I've kind of run myself out of room on the slide, so I'm not gonna draw the picture. It's not the same representation that we drew earlier. Right? Before, I didn't have any of these length zero intervals up there. But it was like, okay, well, um, they're still valid intervals, so let's, let's go with it um, and, and see what we can do with those things. Um, this gives us a special representation as well. There's no way to do this and use fewer endpoints than this algorithm does. So in some sense, it's the most efficient representation. And if you think about it, having different downsets means that one of you has fewer things less than you than the other element does. So you have to have different end left endpoints because one of you's got to have more things that are left of you than the other one does. So you need different endpoints. So this is, um, gives us this particular representation that we're, we're quite happy to have. Um, so I want to talk now about um, another topic in POSETS, um, dimension. And I'm going to give you a couple perspectives on this definition um, because different versions of it resonate with different people. So the dimension of P is the least D so that you have D linear extensions. Okay, I gotta pause and tell you what a linear extension is before I can finish this definition. A linear extension is a total ordering on X. So everything is comparable to everything else. Pick up two things, one's bigger than the other. Um, but it must respect the partial ordering. So if X is less than Y in the partial ordering in P, you must have X less than Y to be a linear extension. You're not allowed to turn something upside down. Two things that are incomparable could go either way, but if one's less than the other, you're stuck with that. 
you're adding more comparabilities until everything is comparable without messing up the existing comparabilities. This and is so what we want. Just, this, this is what we want when we have uh, a bunch of people and you're trying to get them all in some ordering. As long as we know that A is better than B, that somewhere on the list A is higher than B. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so a thing I'm not going to go into, but another topic in post that I study is something called linear discrepancy, where you do, you have this partial ordering and you try to cram them in some line where you don't disrespect the known um, greater than or less than or better than relationships amongst them. Okay, so here's some alternative views on this. So if you think of the relation, the less than or equal to relation, as a set of ordered pairs, like when you first teach intro to proofs and you think about what a relation is, you can think of, this is actually my second bullet, sorry, um, you can think of the partial ordering as being the intersection of all of those sets. Or I tend to use this first version, you need a collection of linear extensions so that every incomparable pair is in one order somewhere and is in the other order somewhere else, right? That if you are in the same order in every linear extension, that needs to correspond with exactly being in that order in the main poset. That if you have this realizer of linear extensions, you need to have both versions. You could also think of this as embedding P in R to the D and then using the coordinate wise ordering on your points that you know, must be less than or equal to and every single coordinate um, corresponds to being less than or equal to. Um, so dimension is a well-studied um, topic. It's known, answering the question, is the dimension um, at most uh, K is known to be MP complete? What do we think might be going on with the dimension of this? <laughs> Notice that the only incomparabilities are between A's and B's. Well, the only incomparabilities between A's and B's are the ones where the subscripts match. The same, yeah. Okay, so I have all of them except A1 and B1 and A2 and B2. So it's not hard to put all the A's at the bottom and all the B's at the top, right? That would be a linear extension. Put the A's in whatever order you want. Put the B's in whatever order you want. But you've got to get every AI over the corresponding BI somewhere. How many of those could you have going on at the same time? So if I put A1 over B1, take a minute and think about where the other things have to wind up. Remind me what the line from A1 up to B2 means in this context. That A1 is less than B2. Okay. And so, so in this case, our, I think someone said it in the chat, kind of, um, every AI is less than all of the BJs where J is not equal to I. Yes. Okay. So what does that tell us about, where does A2 have to go? It, it's got to be down here somewhere. Yeah. I don't know what order A2, A3, A4, and A5 have to go in, but they have to be down here because they're all less than B1. And B2, B3, B4, B5 are all greater than A1. So they've all got to be up here. So I can only swap one pair of AI versus BI in any one linear extension. As soon as I do that, then I can jumble up the remaining A's and the remaining B's however I want, but I can't get any other A greater than any other B. So it turns out the dimension of Sn, this is S5, this is the standard example, we call it, uh, is N. 
you can get away with n, do something that puts B, A1 over B1, then do another one, puts A2 over B2, and so on. And if you're careful with what you do in these top and bottom parts, you can make sure that you have all the A's and B's, all the A's sorted out amongst themselves, and you have all the B's sorted out amongst themselves. Mitch, is this related to a topological dimension that I would find more familiar? Like, is there a way to think of these things as big, chunky, boxy sets in some n-dimensional space, and they're extended so much in one direction and not another? Is that does that make any sense? I'm just I'm it, it, spewing. It does make sense, but not every poset can be represented using any given model for boxy sets. In just like there are generalizations of interval orders to using squares and using you know rect uh, rectangular prisms and, and things like that using um and not just like not every poset is an interval order there is no space where every poset would fit that definition uh, this poset also is sort of worst possible in the sense that it has two end points in dimension n uh, you can actually prove that a poset with m points has at most has dimension at most m over two. So this this satisfies that. So what do we think about interval orders? Do we think that right? They're not allowing that two plus two. This is full of two plus twos, right? Here's a two plus two because we don't have. Oh wait, no. Sorry. There's a two plus two. It's kind of drawn as an X rather than as two matchsticks, but we're missing this comparability and we're missing this comparability. So these are not uh, interval orders. What do we think? Interval orders, anybody, do, can they have large dimension or might they be stuck down somewhere small? I mean, since it's another restriction, my instinct says it's going to be smaller, right? Because you're putting on another restriction. Yeah. So, so, but for example, I guess the question I want to ask that, like, yeah, I think should be smaller, but could we prove a theorem like every interval order has dimension at most 10, no matter how many points the interval order has? Right? There, there are examples of things in discrete mathematics where you can show on the full general class, some property is unbounded, but on well-behaved subclasses that we understand, you're like, oh, this parameter is always at most 10 or at most grams number or something, but, but cannot be made to go to infinity. Well, this is actually a, a, a quite hard question. Um, uh, answered in the mid 70s by Bogart, Rabinovich, and Trotter. For every integer, positive integer d, there's an interval order p with dimension of p greater than or equal to d. Um, the dimension of interval orders, this is going to be a slightly not correct statement, but morally it's true. The dimension of interval orders on n points grows roughly like log log n. So really slowly, they actually have the asymptotics nailed down to the point of where like it's log log n plus a number that's at most five or something like that. Or the, the thing you, the constant you have to add on to it is in an interval, like there's five possible values that, that it could have. Um, but question nobody can give me a satisfactory answer to is draw me an interval order with dimension four that doesn't require, like I think the smallest example I know of has like 50 or 60 points. Like I would like one with like, I can't draw and hold in my head a poset with like 50 or 60 points and understand why it has dimension four other than some big theorem says, well, it's the example for this class that shows that there is one of dimension four. And, and so it's particularly unpleasant. Here's a surprise. For semi-orders, dimension is at most three. So 
interval orders can have unbounded dimension, but as soon as you have to have all the intervals have the same length, you have dimension at most three, and we know what causes you to have dimension equal to three. You must have one of these three posets inside you. So yay, now our characterization result has gotten a little more complicated. Now we have three things you have to avoid, uh, and they each have seven points, which is slightly larger. Um, I will say my, my PhD advisor wrote an entire research monograph on dimension theory for, for posets, and his statement of this theorem is wrong because he put four figures in there, and one of them is not a semi-order. When you stare at it, you find the one plus three. We, we panicked. We were ready to submit a paper, and we're like, wait, we were using the figures from Fishburne's book, and now we look at Tom's book, and there's four things. And so I got to call him out in a comment in a paper correcting the record um, so that if people went to his book to check the result, um, they would not uh, think that we had screwed up. Where did those names come from? Ah, so that's a great question, BK. Uh, not mine, but... Oh, okay. Well, whoever <laughs> asked the question, thank you. Thank, um, Joanna, I think. So there is a, a full classification of all the posets that um, cause you, in, for general posets that have caused you to have dimension three or larger. And there are several infinite families in that classification. And these are, Rabinovich didn't actually identify these three forbidden things. The general dimension three thing was done around the same time. And so people just picked out which three things in that list were semi-orders. And these names come from that big list. Um, and, and we just, we stuck with that notation because that's what they were called elsewhere in the literature. Um, yeah. Uh, I think H naught and G naught are actually like isolated examples of things, but FX2 is a member of an infinite family that kind of like spiders out on the sides. I think it stays height three, but it gets more of this wiggling going on off to the sides. And so another thing that combinatorists are known to care about is how many of something there are. Right? The, if you teach a combinatorics class, you probably start by teaching counting problems, right? Or even an intro discrete math course that maybe also serves as your intro to proof. Maybe you teach various counting things. Uh, and so Fishburne, in this book I mentioned earlier, that he published in the early 80s, one of the like 10 open questions at the end was, how many interval orders are there? Well, okay, so... I want to make this, put this in the framework that combinatorists think about, it, right? I want to think about how many distinct interval orders there are with n points. I want to think about them as posets, so I don't want to think about like that you get to move the interval slightly but not change the left-right relations, right? And unlabeled, if you're familiar with labeled or unlabeled, this is the question of unlabeled. I don't care if you call your points A, B, C, and D, or you call them one, two, three, and four. I want to care about the picture, right? So, um, for, so for semi-orders, the answer is known. Um, known since Wein and Freund in 57 and Dean and some unrelated Keller in 68. The semi-orders are counted by the Catalan numbers, perhaps the most famous counting sequence um, out there, if you exclude the Fibonacci sequence for counting things that we can do recursively. Um, so I, I think somebody, uh, one of the organizers will put a link in the chat. Richard Stanley has a book, uh, two volume book, Enumerative Combinatorics, that has an exercise in like 50 or 60 parts. Here's a list of things enumerated by the Catalan numbers. Find an explicit bijection between each of them and no cheating by saying, you know, compose the one from A to B with the one from B to C to have the bijection from A to C. He also has a PDF that extends that. I think there's there's hundreds. I did the math yesterday. 209 or so. Okay. Yeah. It, it's a ridiculously long list of things. Um, I'm not going to prove this, except I will tell you roughly, if you make a matrix, that a 0-1 matrix that has a 1 if and only in position i, j, if and only if i is less than j, the points for i and j, 
you can do this in such a way that all of the ones are in the upper right-hand corner. And then you're counting lattice paths, which is the canonical, the boundary between the zeros and ones is a lattice path that's the canonical Catalan number problem is lattice paths that don't cross the, the diagonal. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's lots and lots of, they count balanced parentheses, they count um, um, balance or certain families of, of binary trees. Um, okay, so, but the question for interval orders was still open for a long time. Okay, there's one interval order with one point, yeah. There's two interval orders with two points, right? We can draw, you either have two incomparable point things or you have one bigger than the other. And both of those I can draw intervals for, no two plus two. For n equal to three, there's five of them. I drew them all here in terms of intervals, but I can draw the order diagrams for us. Let's see, this is one guy that overlaps two that don't overlap. This is one thing that's bigger than two others, and this is one thing that's less than two others. Okay, we could, we could keep drawing. Uh, there's 15 of them for n equals four. <laughs> There's 53 of them for n equals five. Well, this probably shouldn't be surprising because the semi-orders are all interval orders and they are counted by the Catalan numbers that two n choose n grows exponentially, right? That grows roughly like four to the n um, over root n or something like that. So, okay. Now I wanna talk about something called ascent sequences. So something completely different. These are finite sequences of non-negative integers. Okay, that doesn't sound too scary, right? I think even our Calc 2 students, if we tell them the sequences are gonna be finite, probably wouldn't run in too much terror of these, especially if I promise that we're not gonna make them add them up. Um, an ascent in a sequence is just when you have two consecutive terms in the sequence and the second one is strictly greater than the, the previous one. An ascent sequence starts off at zero, and then xi is at most one more than the number of preceding ascents. So you're like, you're gonna write down xi, you look before you, you say there were three ascents before this position, so you can use any number zero to four. Just count the ascents before you, um, so let's see, okay, we start off with zero, that's good. Uh, now we can use zero or one because we have zero ascents. Now here we have an ascent. So we've got one ascent, so we can use anything up to two. Now we've got another ascent. So we've got one ascent, two ascents. So that tells us any number up through three is legal. So that whole thing is good then. Because I looked ahead and I was like, oh, hey, there's nothing bigger than three being used. Um, Okay, so this starts off the same. Let's see, there's one ascent, there's two ascents, there's three ascents. Oh, hey, now we're good because I don't see anything bigger than four. Because once I've got three ascents, I can use anything up through four. Notice I used four before I used three. That's allowed. You don't have to go through these things. So you could go zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and do that enough times that then suddenly the next thing you use is 50. That would be fine if you've had 49 ascents by the time you, you get to putting the fifth. How many ascents do we have before we get to this five though? I only count three, so this thing has to be at most four. Because we don't get to count the ascent that would be created by the new number to bolster ourselves. Right? So that's not an ascent sequence. Okay, I lied when I said these are something completely different. Um, Buske, Malou, Clayson, Dukes, and Kidiev in 2010 in the Journal of Combinatorial Theory Series A published a bijection between ascent sequences of length n and interval orders. Um, 
they did not know about Greeno's algorithm, and so they didn't realize it was producing the interval representations from that algorithm we saw earlier. They described this bijection in an incredibly painful manner about like, because you add comparabilities and you remove comparabilities and they have all these diagrams. And so that last bit is really my collaborator, Stephen Young and I, and I will show if anyone wants, the very last slide in my deck is the ugliest bijection you've ever seen. And it's the algorithm for converting an ascent sequence into an interval order, but it would might make people cry if I showed it right now. So let's not do that. So they were able to use this bijection to get at an answer to the question of how many are there. But Mitch, is, so it's not just the ascent sequences have something to say directly about which intervals are bigger or to the right of other things? Like the ascents are not the ordering? No. Okay. Hmm. No, you have, you have to read along, process the ascent sequence from left to right and add intervals. And sometimes you cut off existing intervals when you put your new interval in, and sometimes you stretch intervals that were already there at the previous stage. Um, there's a chopping, a stretching, and a shifting. All of those okay. things can, can happen. It's, it took us a couple of weeks to actually understand the bijection. Like, I, I have no idea how they came up with it. Uh, I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what a generating function is. So now here is a, a formal power series, right? So I don't care if this thing converges. I'm not going to put a number in for x. x is a formal symbol. But I have a sequence. And I'm just going to write these down as the coefficients on x to the n. So there is a sequence that is the number of interval orders on n points. A sub n is the number of interval orders on n points. So we can write down a generating function for that sequence. There it is. It's the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the product from i equals 1 to n of the quantity 1 minus the quantity 1 minus t <laughs> to the i. And you can ask Sage to expand that for you, and you can see the 1 and the 2 and the 5 and the 15 and the 53 that I mentioned earlier. They use some incredibly fancy techniques in generating functions um, to get at these sorts of questions um, and how to get at it. And then they discovered that somebody had found this generating function before. They put it into OEIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, and found that in 1998, Stoimanov had found that this generating function counted something called regular linearized chord diagrams. And they actually feel a lot like intervals um, when, you, when you start looking at, at those pictures from Sterminoff's paper. Uh, and since people have taken to calling this sequence the Fishburne numbers, because the most famous class of things that they count are the interval numbers, um, which Fishburne characterized. Um, so here's the problem with semi order. So this is not a semi order. This ascent sequence corresponds to this interval order. And here's a one plus one, two, three, right? That's the one thing we're not allowed to have to be a semi. -order. All I've done is put a two on the end of this. That's the new thing. It turns out that it cuts off this guy right here and turns that one into that one. And now these aren't all the same length, but I can stretch a bunch of these out and make them the same length, and this is a semi-order. At least as a combinatorist, we find this offensive, that you can like end with a semi-order, but along the way, you're like, oh, not a semi-order, now semi-order again, not a semi-order, and you can go back and forth through these things, right? That bothers us. So Stephen Young and I called the ones where you never leave being a semi-order, we called them hereditary. Every step of the way, you're a semi-order. Like, these are nice, but computer scientists use words like nice and good when they describe things, and I try not to, so we called them hereditary. And we were actually able to disprove that hereditary semi-orders are built of things that look like this, with some rules for how we can put them next to one another. 
and I don't want to get into the technicalities of it. This is a 30 page paper that was just published in the Electronic Journal of Combinatorics. So it's uh, open access, it's on archive, you can look me up. Um, we got really great comments from the referees because, uh, I mean, it took a year and a half to get it reviewed, but they really said we put good examples in. And so if you find this interesting, we did a lot of careful description of what's going on with these things. Um, and so you can glue them together and we had to like find these weird symbols for different ways of putting things together because this one has an O floating up there because occasionally you can have an interval of length two that bridges the gap or the boundary between these building blocks but these dashed lines are the boundaries between my building blocks. Um, so the cool thing we were able to do is we were able, and there's my collaborator, Stephen Young, um, we were able to find a generating function for the number of hereditary semi-orders with n points. Now you might say, well, but Mitch, you just made up the definition of hereditary semi-order. Like, why would, why should anyone care? Especially when I tell you that we got to add a new sequence to OEIS because of this. Nobody had ever found anything counted by this sequence before. And so you might go, huh, okay. So you define something and then you counted it. That's, that's great, thanks. Here's the cool thing we were able to do beyond that. We were able to prove that the semi-orders of dimension two, now remember semi-orders have dimension one, two, or three, right? They don't never have dimension more than three, is we were able to prove the ones that have dimension at most two are hereditary with some additional restrictions. Okay, don't worry about what those second and third bullets say. Just read them as additional restrictions on what types of blocks you can put. And we were able to, by plugging generating, if you've never worked with generating functions before, sometimes they're described as snake oil because like you multiply them and cool things happen and you plug one into another one and cool things happen and you raise it to the nth power, which I guess is just multiplying over and over again in this case, and cool things happen and they count things in ways that we can understand. And that's what we did. We like, we plug generating functions for blocks into generating functions for the rules for how you can line the blocks up. And we got this generating function. which Jeff Remmel, who was a prominent, uh, he's since passed, but he was a prominent uh, combinatorist at UC San Diego, uh, expert in generating functions. We showed this to Jeff at one point. He's like, that is the ugliest generating function I have ever seen that counts anything that people might care about. Uh, and, Extreme old case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this also gave us a new sequence for OEIS, which that surprised us, right? We thought, well, this this relates to dimension. This isn't this new hereditary thing that nobody had really talked about before. This relates to dimension. That's a thing people should have studied. And it turns out that, yeah, no. And, and so we know the Catalan numbers count all of them. So we also put in a third sequence, which was the Catalan numbers minus this sequence, which then gives you the ones of dimension, because this is the ones of dimension at most two. All right, so we were able to do some cool counting things there, and I'm just being cognizant of time. And so I think I'm going to uh, omit this next part and just stop there and thank you guys. It's on mute. Uh, Take the speaker. And, and, and there's the horrific bijection. There have been requests for you to dance this result, or I, I would actually like to um, your your hereditary diagrams. I'd like to see them turned into music box uh, things. So yeah, that's a good idea. Oh. I thought I really like that diagram. That cool. And there's the kitty. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, th this is amazing that he was this well behaved because when I was practicing, he was never this well behaved. <laughs> Amy, did you have a question? No, I was just saying hi. So I was looking at those those generating function values. They look like they're approaching the Catalan number somehow. The Catalan uh, generating function. You get the 
I don't know if, if you're, you're adding more and more restrictions, I guess it's getting closer and closer to the Catalan number sequence. Yeah, well, so, so the thing is like the first couple of, that's what happens when you have a part of your talk you don't get to because people were engaged, which makes me happy. Um, right, the first few are gonna look like Catalan numbers because there's nothing on fewer than seven points that, uh, well, let's see if we look at the dimension one, yeah. There's nothing on fewer than seven points that is, a, is dimension three. So you're going to see the Catalan numbers, right? But the generating function for the Catalan numbers isn't right, rational. Right, right. It's got a square root in it. Hmm. So that that was what, like, right, that other, the busquet malu generating function, until I saw it in this paper, I'd never seen it. I was like, I'd seen things that were like, rationally-ish or had like a square root in the denominator or something, but like, oh, now we're gonna put a product that the number of factors is the term that you're in. And oh, by the way, you've got to multiply this one minus T to the I out inside there. And yeah. I mean, the works, the, the, the works that she always works on are always amazing in terms of those generating functions and the things that she and her collaborators can do with uh, with them. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, like, I st to be honest, like we understand the correspondence between the ascent sequences and the um, interval orders now. The techniques that they use to to find this generating function, they find a they found a relationship that the yeah. generating function must satisfy, and then they solved like this functional equation. Functional and, equations, yeah. And, and pulled this out, and we're like, ta-da! We're like. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's part of why it took so long to get this paper refereed is half of it was generating function stuff, not fancy stuff, like all the generating function stuff that Stephen and I did in our results over here. Our, the actual building of the generating function stuff is stuff that I would do in an undergraduate combinatorics course. Like, oh, now you plug this in to the nth power or raise it to the nth power or do something like that. Um, but the POSET stuff is really hardcore structural combinatoric sorts of things, understanding the structure of these, yeah. which the people who study generating functions and do enumeration are not really great at. Like the title of the busquet malu paper is actually something like a set sequence is an enumeration of two plus two free POSETs because they were only marginally familiar with the idea of an interval order. Uh, and so uh, that's been interesting, trying to bridge the boundary between those two areas. Um, but they did eventually find us referees who could get through it. And after waiting a year and a half, we got it accepted. Right. I think we need to make sure that we uh, advertise next week. Yes. Um, so Tian, she couldn't be here today really sad about it, but um, his talk is described out here, Universal X Homotopy Cover for Graphs. His original title was something like, the universal cover for graphs is actually universal. So um, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so I think we're going to, we're in for something exciting. Shall we thank Mitch one more time? Mm -hmm. Great.